explorers and settlers started coming to Mount Rainier in the late 1800s. Can you imagine what it was like back then? Who are these people? And what are their stories? Oh, hold on there. I'd like to take credit for finding this grand place, but some of that credit's got to go to my horses, old shot. Well, we were camped over by the river, just over yonder there, and old shot come up a missing. And so I set out looking for him, and I followed this here deer path, and lo and behold, it led me right here into the meadow, just over beyond the trees there, and there was old shot. And he was uh, drinking from this bubbling spring. <laughs> I, got, I got me an idea right there of the potentiality of this here place. And so I got me a vial of water, and when we got back to Yelm, I sent it clean off to Chicago for a testing. And I got a smart report right back from them that there are healthy minerals in all of these waters around here. My family and I got us a mineral claim here. We built up the cabins over here, and two years ago, we put up a hotel. In the hidden meadow found by Old Shot, James Longmire and his family developed a popular Mineral Springs resort. It was the foundation for the Longmire Historic Landmark District that still exists today. But not everyone felt that the mountain and wilderness should be developed. One man in particular, John Muir, became a leader in the conservation movement, inspired in part by his visit to Mount Rainier in 1888. The, the, the making of paddocks goes on all over civilizations, all over the world. We all need beauty as well as bread. Places to play in and places to pray in. Places where nature can reach down and touch and heal and give light to body and soul alike. Now, in the making of the West, if nature had paddocks in mind, surely this Mount Rainier region would have been one of them. Or the trees go to about 6,000 feet, and above them is a zone of wildflowers, so rich and luxuriant. It's as if nature, happy to set aside a space atwixt woods so dense and ice so deep, we're economizing the precious ground and seeing how many of her precious darlings she could put into a single mountain wreath. It is the finest subalpine garden I have ever seen, a floral elysium. My friends, seek the mountain. Seek the mountain and its blessings like sunshine will seek into the trees and winds will blow your freshness into you and storms their enemy energies and your cares will drip off like autumn leaves. Nature's peace I give to you. Many people were drawn here for a different reason. They came to climb the mountain. But it wasn't just men answering this challenge. Faye Fuller was the first woman to climb Mount Rainier, and she accomplished this feat in 1890. Welcome, fellow adventurous souls, to the sweet forested hillsides of the Grand Mount Tahoma. Perhaps some of you have heard the account of my recent ascent, which I published in the Tacoma Ledger, and of which some of the more delicate members of our society have recently spoken ill on account of me being unchaperoned with four male climbing companions and the nature of my climbing costume. But no matter, I trust that hardy citizens like yourselves understand that the lure of the mountains is by no means limited to men in such changing times as these. Nor is it impossible that a young woman such as myself could achieve such a grand physical feat as the summit of Tahoma. Spend a few weeks on its hillsides this summer if you want to fall in love with the world again. The beauty and grandeur you will find here will give you new life. And as for me, I am satisfied for I have accomplished what I always dreamed of and feared impossible. The experiences of men and women like John Muir and Faye Fuller inspired the public 
and helped to establish Mount Rainier as America's fifth national park on March 2nd, 1899. But what does it mean to be a national park? People came here for many different reasons, and the young park had its share of growing pains. Oh, my manners, my name is Grinville Allen. I'm the acting superintendent of this magnificent new national park. You know, the, the horse and buggies are being phased out and most of America is now traveling by auto. And so, uh, and the Longmires have put up quite a decent road from Yelm and Eatonville up here to Longmire. And there's been a, a, a very nicely established trail up to Camp of the Clouds or Paradise for several years now. Um, so my first reaction to allowing autos in the park was to say no. I wanted to have more time to research um, as to what these auto car, their impacts on the park and the, the visitor experience. But to my dismay, the Secretary of Interior thought otherwise and he issued auto permits. So uh, this past year of 1907 and 8, we uh, issued 117 permits and we're the first national park to allow cars in. Who knows, by 1950, we might have to issue uh, 500 permits. Grinville Allen worked hard to make decisions to preserve this wilderness, but also to create opportunities for park visitors to enjoy it. Those visitors also played a very big role in the development of the national park. One such early visitor was Ashel Curtis. He helped organize one of the first park visitor groups, the Mountaineers. I want to welcome you to this mountain and invite you to join the Mountaineers Club made of private citizens just like yourself. We Mountaineers started five years ago back in 1906 and we love recreating at this majestic mountain. We also have the ear of the park administration too, involve important matters like making this park safer to use while we preserve it. There were a lot of other guides who didn't care about the park, preserving it or protecting it. They would hunt and mine and sell liquor and all sorts of unsavory things. Things are getting much better now that we, the Mountaineers, are cooperating with the, the Park Service. Well, that's a, enough about us Mountaineers. If you want any more information, please let me know. I will be around the Longmire Springs area until I head up to Paradise on Thursday. Please, just, just let me grab one more. One of the first men to climb Mount Rainier was P.B. Van Trump. Like Ashel Curtis, P.B. was a strong advocate for the national parks, and he went on to become a national park ranger. He was a master storyteller and loved to share his stories with the visitors. Oh, well, pardon me, I forget my manners. My name is Philman Beecher Van Trump, P.B. for short. Superintendent Allen wants me to meet with the secretaries upon their arrival and tell them all about Mount Tahoma and my trip to the summit with General Stevens back in 1870. For those of us who climb the mountain or make the attempt, this is the meaning of the mountain. It's the ultimate challenge. It's the highest peak. It's the final test of our character. If we face such a challenge the same way we face any challenge in life, by having the nerve to begin, and the courage to never give up. Of course, we all face mountains in life, some made of rock and ice, others made of our own imperfect hopes and dreams and the narrow expectations of others around us. These things in no way affect what we can do or who we are. Well, what about you? What mountains do you face in your life? And how will you challenge them? At any rate, it's been a pleasure. Most people began their journey to the mountain here by road. From the first automobile in 1907, visitors and their vehicles continue to shape the development of Mount Rainier National Park. Well, hello there. I drove all the way up from Long to Longmire Springs from Tacoma today to pick up my niece. She and some friends have been hiking on a backcountry trail for the past three days. I'm supposed to meet her here at the gas station. Did you know this was the first national park to allow automobiles within the park boundaries? Well, it was, even before Yellowstone. Not only were automobiles allowed within the park, the park was actually planned to accommodate them. Park planners laid out the road to take advantage of the most beautiful 
of mountain scenes and car camps and inns were built for weary travelers in mind. Of course, I myself would not have been driving within the park last year. Until this year, 1914, women were not allowed to drive within the park. Now, it wasn't a rule or written down anywhere. It was just understood. You know what I mean. Aunt Eleanor, hello. How was your drive? Oh, it was wonderful. I had no trouble at all. Did you have a good time? Oh, it was terrific. I can't wait until the Wonderland Trail is finished. Just think, a trail that lets you hike all the way around the mountain. How grand. And now, with autos, you can drive right here to Longmire Springs and hike on into the backcountry. Or if hiking isn't your cup of tea, <laughs> you can drive through the park like my Aunt Eleanor and stay the night in one of the inns. Well, Joanne, it's about time to head back to Tacoma. <sighs> I suppose. It's always so hard to leave. So nice to get away from the hustle and bustle of life in the city and just relax mm -hmm. in the pristine backcountry. Now, don't forget, Aunt Eleanor, you promised me I could drive on the way home. I did? Mercy. Well, a promise is, to, is a promise. We're, We're ladies, ladies from Tacoma, Tacoma, come to visit Mount Tahoma. Our car broke down, but we won't frown. We're going to push it into town. So don't you fret, we'll get there yet. For we're courageous suffragettes. Preserved by the National Park Service for over a century, the stories of these early park visitors live on in the national park that they helped to create. Who knows? In another hundred years, maybe visitors will hear your story and remember how you helped shape the future of Mount Rainier National Park.